to continue, uh, basically, usually uh, if you are using the small data set, if all the data can fit in the RAM, you, uh, the speed of operation will be the most uh, fast because uh, uh, this is actually related to the computer structure. And uh, I don't want to go too much detail because uh, again, this is a uh, course that should be focused on the database system. Uh, but basically, every like in the computer system, there are, the speed is different at every level. So uh, usually when you uh, code something, when you analyze data, when you like uh, uh, deal, when you deal with the data in the system, those data you deal with at the moment will be loaded into the RAM. So that's why it is important to have a big RAM size, especially for the server. And you also know that like if your PC has a, a bigger RAM size, in general, the speed is much faster. It's because the working data will be loaded into the RAM, that's why. And, and then if your data is stored in the hard disk drive, it will be slow, right? So everyone, uh, so that's basically the system. So basically what's happening is this, if your data set, if your working data set you are currently dealing with cannot fit in your RAM size, then what's happening is that the current working parts will be loaded into RAM, but the rest will be in the disk. So let's just say that you have a really big data stored in a collection. So let's just say that you have a really huge uh, customer collection and you wanna find a customer whose AZ is uh, 25, something like that. Then MongoDB has to scan a uh, customer document to see whether they, their AZ is 25 to find those customers. Then if uh, the customer collection is too big, a certain, the first part of a customer collection will be loaded here and the MongoDB will check to find the customer with the 25 age. And then after done, this part will be go back to the hard disk drive and the next part will be loaded into RAM and MongoDB will check again, something like that. So when the data size is huge, uh, basically the RAM and the hard disk drive where your data is stored permanently, they will keep exchanging information. And in the computer system, we call that as a swapping. Basically the data will be swapped between RAM and the uh, hard disk drive. And if you have more swaps, basically the performance will be slow. Basically each swap uh, takes a time because of the difference in speed. The RAM is much faster, but the hard disk drive or solid state disk drive, which is faster than hard disk drive, but they are still slower than RAM, that's why. So more swap basically, a slower performance. So there are uh, approaches. There are two different approaches to solve this problem. The first uh, approach is a vertical scaling. Basically, you are scaling up. What it means is that if your RAM size is small, uh, basically you add more power. If your RAM size is small, you buy bigger RAM and upgrade the computer. If your CPU is slower, you buy faster CPU and upgrade your PC. So basically your system is getting bigger and bigger. So you are making a supercomputer. That's a traditional approach. And we call that as a vertical scaling. Another approach is this. It's called the horizontal scaling. Basically it's scaling out. Uh, basically you are adding more small machines to work together. Uh, basically in this case, you add to connect more server and you are making a distributed system and network. So in MongoDB, we call this as a sharding uh, or scaling strategy, basically. So if the data size is too big, so if it is difficult to handle in one PC, you uh, separate data into two pieces and two PC can handle at the same time. Still, if it's not enough, we separate data into three pieces and three pieces, three PC can work together concurrently like this. So this is called the horizontal scaling and it is also called the scaling out approach. And in MongoDB uh, and other big data system, they are trying to utilize this approach. And uh, I didn't, I think I didn't put it in this slide, but there are actually different costs between this approach and this approach. So if you are uh, interested in making your own PC, or if you have a uh, done like a buying 
different system by your different computer system components by yourself, then probably you may have uh, an idea of this like a cost versus like a uh, performance. So let's say that there is like a CPU or RAM, and if you want to increase uh, the CPU speed into twice or RAM size into twice, usually the price doesn't go twice. So let's say that you are using like a 64 gigabyte of RAM here. And if you want to upgrade into 200, 128 gigabyte of RAM, then the performance increases by twice because the RAM size is twice, but the price will increase more than twice. So actually vertical scaling is quite expensive. So your performance will increase linearly, but your costs increase exponentially. So making a supercomputer is very expensive. But in horizontal scaling, the cost of upgrading and performance boost is going together. So basically you have a uh, 64 gigabyte of RAM here and you make another PC with a 64 gigabyte of RAM then total it's 128 gigabyte. So basically you pay, so the performance increased by twice and you pay twice because it's the same system. It's similar to here. The performance increased from here to here uh, three times and you buy same two more PC. So cost also increased by three times. So basically in this case, horizontal scaling, the cost of upgrading PC increase at the same level as the performance boost. So horizontal scale, so that's why many in the big data system, many people prefer horizontal scaling and scaling out approach because uh, um, it can save the cost as well. So that's uh, one thing I want to mention. That, that's why the horizontal scaling is actually considered as like a good approach to save the cost. So this is uh, uh, basically what I uh, mentioned last time. So in the NoSQL data management, so in the in the beginning we talked about this. If there is a big data, and this data is just so huge, so we cannot fit this big data into one system, we we'll divide this into three: A part, B part, C part, and we we'll separate in different servers. So A part here, B part here, C part here is just stored like this. And then we make a, if the C part is accessed a lot from the user, we make a replica, replica replication basically. So these three servers will contain the same C part data and they will handle multiple users requests at the same time. So that's how uh, no SQL data uh, management is working. And the question is this, when we implement this kind of distributed system with uh, many small PC, uh, how to define what goes here and what goes here? So let's say that we have a customer collection, huge customer collection, then we divide it into three parts. How should we divide? And which part should go here and which part should go here? There should be a certain way, right? So we have to define what goes into A server, what goes into B server. So that's basically the sharding. So in MongoDB, when you have a distributed system and this collection, let's say that we have a one terabyte of a collection and this document should be divided into four and it should be saved into uh, four different PC then uh, we have to define which 256 gigabyte of document should be stored here and here, here, here. So we have to de determine which document to go here and which document to go here like this. So that's called the sharding approach. And in MongoDB, the user has to define the child key. And based on the child key, uh, this key will determine documents to be stored together. So you define shard key and based on the shard key, it will be determined which information will be stored here, which documents will be stored here and which documents to be stored here like this. So data will be basically partitioned into shards based on the same value of the shard key. So you can think of this as something like a grouping in aggregation. So uh, if you remember uh, in the last time, when we talked about the uh, aggregation function, we used the group operator at one part. And one of the thing we did is that when we have a, uh, the, the zip code data in the US, we had four different states. And for each state, uh, we calculate uh, uh, how many zip codes are there. And at that time, as a group ID, we used the state. So something like that. If you use a state as a child key, 
based on the state information, the document will be set separated. So let's say that you use a state as a child key, then New York data will be stored here, Illinois data will be stored here, Texas data will be stored here like this. Based on the same value on the child key, data will be partitioned and stored into different server. So that's what you can think. And here, uh, the child represent a server basically, the separate place to store data. So this part is very technical. So if you have any question or if you uh, want me to like uh, re explain some parts, please let me know freely uh, as I go. So when you have to use sharding, so that's another important thing. So first of all, one is quite uh, straightforward when you don't have enough disk space to store entire data, uh, basically you have a big data. The size of the data is just so big. So you cannot fit all the data into one disk space, then you have to do shard. You have to utilize multiple server. That's the first reason. And the second reason to shard is this. You want to increase query throughput. So basically there are a lot of user requests on your server and you want to increase the number of operations per second then you can divide the data into multiple server and you can uh, reroute uh, each user's request into different server. Then multiple server can handle multiple requests so it will be faster. Basically, you want to respond to queries much faster. So uh, you want to handle a lot of user requests fast. So if you want to increase the performance, you can also do sharding. So basically, first reason to shard is when data cannot fit into one server. Then you have to divide it and store into a multiple server. Second reason is when there are a lot of user requests. So if one server cannot efficiently handle all the operation, you can make a, you can set up distributed system and you can utilize a multiple system together to handle a multiple user request more efficiently. So those are two reasons to utilize sharding in MongoDB. So this is one huge case. Uh, actually, uh, I'm not sure whether you heard about Foursquare application. Um, it, it used to be a quite popular application in the US. Uh, I'm not sure now. Uh, I'm, not sure whether people still use it, but at the time, actually, it was quite popular application. So what is the first query is this? So basically in the US, um, they go to like a different place. Sometimes you go to restaurant, sometimes you go to like a, a museum or something like that. Then you can use a first care basically to uh, share where you are going with your friends. So today you went to museum, then you use a first care app and you check in into museum. Then your friends can see that you went to museum today. Then if your friends are around you or they can meet up together or something like that. So basically it's sharing what you are doing uh, kind of in a geolocation uh, with the geolocation information. So first care uh, at the time when they were popular, they had 50 million users and they had a 6 billion check-in information on their database system. And first care was utilizing MongoDB to handle and store this information at the time. So they had a 50 million user document basically in their system. So it's a huge amount of information. And they also have to store 6 billion check-in information. That's again, another huge information. And the first care had 55 million points of interest and venue, basically it's like restaurants and museum and those other places people uh, utilize to check in. And also there were 1.7 million merchants using the platform for marketing. So also they provide some, uh, uh, some like uh, marketing tools for the merchants so that they can come here and they can like promote or something like that. And when uh, first care was popular, they have to handle about 300,000 operations every second. And so of course uh, this number is quite huge and one server was not able to handle all the entire operation. So they had to utilize a distributed system and they, of course, just like any other company these days, they were utilizing a big data system with a multiple server. So in total, in their MongoDB database system, they had 5.5 billion documents. 
the huge number of documents. So what they did is this. So to handle all these many, uh, all these big data, they utilized the MongoDB. And at the time, they had 11 MongoDB clusters, uh, basically 11 different servers. And each server, they had multiple shards. So here, the cluster and shards are uh, kind of a different concept. So if I give you a simple information, the cluster is basically different to like a server, different to like a physical server. You can consider that as that. And uh, shard is a different uh, space. Like in one server, you can make a multiple space, just like in one PC, you can make a multiple partition, multiple disk partition. It is similar to that. So in one logic, the largest cluster had 15 shards basically for checking information. And when they uh, basically, they have a multiple shards basically. So they have a multiple shards across the multiple clusters and they have to determine how they are uh, checking information uh, should be saved. And to do that, they used the user ID as a shard key. So they, they sharded their checking information based on user ID. So it will be something like this. So if a shard is not done or shard is done badly, then user A's checking information will be stored here and here in like a different server. So because uh, checking information is so huge, so they had like a 5.5 billion like documents. So it cannot be saved in one disk space. So the collection is too huge. So it's saved in different uh, shards. And if uh, the sharding is not done correctly, user age checking information might be here and here like in a different uh, shard. Then the problem is this, the user, a, he goes to his uh, profile page and he wanted to he wants to check where he has been visited before. Then what's happening is that if the sharding is not done, uh, we don't know which shard contain user A's information. So we have to check here to find his information. We have to check here to find his information. We have to check basically all the shards. Then the problem is that there is no point of utilizing sharding because we, the main purpose of doing sharding is to increase performance. So we want and we expect performance boost. But if we have to check all the collection across all the shards, then basically we are going through all the data. So it will be slow. So there is no performance boost. But if we do sharding correctly, so if sharding is done based on user ID, then MongoDB will store user age check-in information or in the same server. So we will know that this shared B will contain all user age information. So we don't need to check other server. We only need to check this shared B to find the user age information. So we can reduce the number of documents to scan in this case. So the, uh, the operation will be fast. We will have a performance boost. So that's why uh, sharding is important in this case, and also it's important to use what to use as a uh, child key. That's the important part. So in this case, in case of first care, when they sharded on user ID, basically uh, checking information of the same user is physically stored on the same database server. So we can provide fast read and write operation because whenever we want to read a certain user's check-in information, we can read from here. And whenever we write, we can just write on this server. We don't need to worry about the other server. So that's a basic concept of uh, sharding. And that's how the, uh, in this case, that's how the first care utilized the sharding uh, to have the performance boost on their application. So to uh, give you more detail, so this is the entire MongoDB architecture. So in the future, uh, in the organization and in the company, um, the, yeah, so they will utilize multiple server like this, multiple shards, and each shard will contain multiple data set like this. So this uh, represents the full architecture of the MongoDB, and let me give you a brief introduction. 
So it, it will be like uh, important to understand how the MongoDB actually works uh, from the application level to the like the server uh, server system level. So first of all, we have an application. So application is this website or like a uh, mobile application or some program that people use to communicate for online service. So like in for the example of the first care, there is a mobile application and website. So people use those two applications to uh, see their information and to send a request to the system. So there's application on the top and there's driver. So driver is basically where it handles all the interaction between database, which is MongoDB and application programming language. So driver is something like this. Um, if you remember, like uh, when we talk about the relational database uh, together with the third party application, uh, I mentioned that if you want to connect to relational database from the third party application, you have to install appropriate driver. So it's the same here. So uh, to connect this application with the MongoDB server, you need to install driver. So if in application in the third party application, if they send a request, the driver will handle and send it to the MongoDB server. So uh, yeah, it's there. You just need to install it. And then we have a query router. So query router is basically a Mongo S. A Mongo S is uh, in MongoDB they call query router also as a Mongo S. I'm gonna talk more about this later. Uh, basically, query router determines where to send query request from user. So using application or user send request the request will come through driver to query router. And this query router is basically MongoDB server. So MongoDB server received that query. And when your MongoDB server is sharded in multiple server, this query router determines where to send your request. So if, so for example, user age information in earlier case is stored in shard two, then the query router should send your request to shard two, something like that. And then for each shard, is each server, we can consider that, and each server will contain multiple uh, data information. So here for each shard, we have a primary and secondary. So primary is a collection that stores the most up-to-date data. So let's say that, um, so I'm, I'm gonna give you more information later. So yeah, let me just skip here and let me give you more information later. So most of the data, up-to-date data will be stored in the primary collection. And there's also secondary. So secondary is a replication set, which is a backup of a primary. Let's say that in shard one, we have a primary data set and user request to read a lot from this primary data set then we want to utilize a multiple server. So we make a replication on shard two and shard three. So when a users make a request to the, this primary data set, sometimes they send a request to here so that uh, multiple server can handle the request at the same time. So that's the basic concept. So this is the full architecture of the MongoDB. And uh, given that, let me give you some uh, example how the MongoDB will handle some operation from the user. So let's think about the uh, case of Twitter. So in Twitter, let's say that there is Obama. So Obama has his own Twitter account. And uh, when he was president and still, uh, he's using Twitter very regularly to write something. So he wrote the tweet on the Twitter like mobile application. Then his tweet request will go to the application send to driver and go to the query router and query router has to determine where to send his request. So let's say that shard one has a primary data set and this primary data set contains Obama documents. Then query router will send his write to a request into shard one. And shard one, this primary data set will be updated because it contains all the Obama's tweet information. And later, user B and user C, a lot of users 
basically will try to access the Obama's profile and they want to read the tweets written by Obama. Then their request will be sent to the application and sent to query router. And query router has to determine where their read operation to be sent. So of course they can, query router can send their operation to shard one. However, the problem is that if there are too many users who are trying to read from the same person, then sending all the requests to here is inefficient because uh, there are other servers we can utilize. So what's happening is that uh, if this primary step is accessed a lot by users, the MongoDB will make a replication. So they copy this data and store it in the shard two as a secondary, which is a replication basically, the copied data set. Also on shard three, we will copy this data set here and make a secondary. So it's not the primary, but it's a replication from another server basically. Then in this case, when multiple people are requesting to read over the tweet, query router can send the request to here or here or here. So any place is possible. In that case, uh, the MongoDB is able to handle the read write operation much efficiently. So that's the basic concept utilizing this MongoDB architecture. So any, any questions so far? So this part is, uh, so I understand that this part is, might be a little bit technical for some people, um, but it's quite, it's, it's, quite, it's quite a useful part. And also it's kind of good to understand this part because uh, uh, this is uh, uh, kind of the main region and where many people utilize this kind of system. So that's the basic concept. And another, so, so in this case, basically, um, in this case, it's the example when we use a user ID as a sharding. So based on the user ID, we can shard in this way, right? So Obama document here, like this. And another, in the practice, in the real world, another um, quite frequently used way of sharding is based on the geolocation. So when they determine the shard key, they use the geolocation information to shard um, the data. So this is uh, um, another important thing because uh, the thing is this, uh, these days like big companies like uh, uh, Google, Netflix, or those companies, they have a data center all over the world. So in case of Google, they have a data center in the US. They also have a data center in like Singapore. They also have a data center in Europe. So those data center basically handle requests from the local area. So Singapore Google data center will handle uh, data requests from the like South Asia and the uh, the Korea data center from the Google will handle the request from like East Asia, something like that. The reason is that even though our internet speed is fast, still when we send a request, uh, when, when we send a request to the server, the request has to go through the cable. So it's not entirely wireless. So it has to go through the cable. And if we are in Hong Kong, and if we want to access the data stored in the US server, uh, there is a, well, basically it takes more time. So let's say that, uh, let's say that Google, let's say that a company has a data center in uh, Hong Kong and the US. And if you are living in Hong Kong, and if you send a request to read the data from Hong Kong server or US server, then of course a request uh, sent to US server will take more time because physically, your request uh, went, had to go through uh, the underwater cable installed under the sea. So physically, it's a longer distance. <clears throat> in most cases, we don't notice that difference because uh, for each individual, it feels like a very small time. But if the request, uh, if, but if the company receive a lot of requests, combining that small time all together, it can actually uh, become a, like a much longer time. So in terms of science, uh, we call that as a kind of a latency problem. When the physical location is, when the physical location of the server is further, um, 
uh, basically the time it takes to get a request and to get the answer from the server takes longer. So that's why uh, if you go to like uh, US, most of the financial investment company is located near where there is a financial uh, the market is located. So like there's a New York Stock Exchange and most of the financial company in New York is located around there, like Wall Street. Also same in the Chicago. You can see that all the like financial companies, investment companies are located together, closer together to the stock exchange market server like that because of the latency. Even though it's very small time, uh, the competition is very, uh, yeah, very severe. Oh, so yeah, this one, I'll talk more about this later. I uh, Right now, I'm talking more about the concept and later I'll show you a demo of how actually we can implement this in the system. So that's why we are using the geolocation sharding. When we have a multiple server located in multiple, uh, yeah, yeah, but so it's, first of all, that's why companies are utilizing servers in different physical location or across the world. And second, that's why people are using uh, geolocation sharding because uh, uh, when, pe when local people try to access the information, it is better to provide those requests from the local server, that's faster. So understanding that concept, let me tell you how the geolocation sharding will work. So let's just think of this as an example of Netflix. Uh, something like that, video streaming uh, website, then there will be Hong Kong users and US users. So Hong Kong users will use this application, US users will also use this application. They are located in different country, Hong Kong, Asia, US, uh, yeah, in, the, in the America. Then first of all, the company may set up server in different uh, locations like this. So a company made a server in Hong Kong, Korea, US, Germany, for example. Then the primary data set in the Hong Kong server will be Hong Kong documents, Hong Kong movie or something like that. And the, um, the, the primary data set in the Korean server will be Korea documents, basically Korean movie, Korean TV series. And the primary set in the US server will be US documents, US movie, uh, US TV series, something like that. Same for Germany. So German the server in Germany will contain German documents in primary data set. So that will be their primary data set because most of the people in the local area will access the local contents a lot. So based on that expectation, we can set up like this. And we can also investigate the behavior of users in different area. And let's say that we found this kind of behavior. So Hong Kong users, they mostly watch a Hong Kong movie, which is in the primary data set. And we also found that many watch Korean TV series, but they really don't watch German films. Then this is what we can do. Oh, so actually, yeah, sorry about this. This part is wrong. Let me remove it. Okay. Uh, let me put it again. Okay, so, so basically, because we know that they watch many Korean TV series, what we can do is that if we send their, whenever they request to watch a Korean TV series, if we send their request to the Korean server, which is located in different country, which is much further from Hong Kong, it, it will not be efficient because their request should travel further to the server location, which is far from their uh, local area. So it is better to send their request into their local server, which is child one, the server in the Hong Kong. So what we do is that as a secondary data set, we copy this information from here to here. So we make a secondary replication data set. So whenever Hong Kong people request to watch a movie, uh, like Hong Kong movie or Korean TV series, the query router can simply route their request into child one. So it will be faster. And then for US user, same. Uh, if the US user, their information is stored here. So many of the US documents is here. So when they watch US TV series, we can just route their um, 
request into their local server in the US and we can give it back. And then we found that some watch Korean TV series, but they rarely watch Hong Kong movies. So I think I also made a mistake here. So we don't need to copy this here. Mm. Okay. So in that case, because we know that a significant number of people watch Korean TV series, we can also make a replication set here. So when the US people request to watch Korean TV series, we can just uh, make their request to go to their local server in the US so that their request doesn't travel further. So we can just uh, get the data from secondary data set and give it back to the US user. And we don't put, we don't make it a uh, German documentary secondary set here. And we don't make Korea, uh, we don't make Hong Kong documentary here as a secondary set because they rarely watch German film and they rarely watch Hong Kong movie in this case. So this is an example. So in that case, we don't need to make another secondary set for the Hong Kong documents because many people will not request that. So their request can be simply sent to here, even though it takes a little bit longer time because most of people do not use this functionality. So that's uh, an example of a geo. Okay, so I think there was like a, a disconnection. Let me share the screen again. Yeah, it looks like I lost connection somehow. So let me share again. Okay. Oh yeah, I'm just curious. So, um, so this part did I finish explanation or did you hear everything? Can you let me know? Okay. Okay, so this part was fine. Okay. So let me go to the next one. Yeah, so earlier, um, yeah. So earlier, uh, basically, I mentioned about primary set and the secondary set, secondary data set, and we are making a replication. If the content is accessed by more people, we'll be in more shared. Yeah, that's of course. So if the content, a certain content is accessed by more people, we can utilize more shared basically. So something like this. Uh, in this case, I didn't really put it here, but uh, like, uh, um, so for example, this, the main area of operation is the US. So there are much more US user for this application than other users, even though it provides a service globally. Then you can of course make more US server and you can make more shard. So that's, a, uh, yeah, definitely that's also possible. And many, actually many companies are doing that. And another concept, replication concept is this. So the primary data set uh, is basically primary data set in every shard. In every shard, we have a certain primary data set which contains most up-to-date information. And when this information is accessed a lot, then we'll make the secondary data set in another server to handle the operation much efficiently. So we, so we call that as replication. So we copy primary into secondary storage, secondary server, we call that as a replication. And once the primary and secondary sets are made like this, uh, they keep uh, exchanging signal each other to see whether there's any update. If there's an update on primary, secondary will be updated together later. And if there's an update on secondary, primary and secondary will be updated together like this. So you, you don't need to worry about this because MongoDB will handle this once you set up all the uh, like system. And sometimes it's possible uh, if uh, one server may fail. It's quite common in the uh, big data system because big data system utilizes a lot of data and handle a lot of operation. Sometimes the system fail. So let's say that one uh, primary uh, the server that contain primary data set fails, then what happens is that when they exchange a signal, they found out that this doesn't work anymore. Then there are only two data set left. 
then they choose one of them as a primary. So one become primary and the other become secondary like this. So this is what uh, MongoDB says uh, as automatic failover. So in the MongoDB, actually, they say that uh, utilizing sharding is a, uh, a very good thing to keep kind of uh, stability of the system in the MongoDB server. Is there a timeout uh, required during creating the application? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether I understand the question correctly. You are you talking about like what happens if uh, one doesn't respond in a certain time or something like that? You mean, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry whether I don't understand it correctly. So what do you mean by like, do you mean that what if like uh, one server doesn't respond in a, um, in a certain time? range or something like that oh yeah yeah i think so um i didn't really check it but when i think what's happening is that one server when they don't respond within a yeah i'm not exactly sure i think i need to check the document actually uh, but there should be like a there should be some like a default setting. And I think you can also change the setting in the future. The, I think by default, they will keep checking each other. And if uh, one server fails to communicate for a long time, then uh, it will consider it as a fail. Uh, but I, I'm not sure about the exact like uh, time range. Yeah, that should be checked or that can be actually changed, I think. Yeah, let me check more about that next time. So basically, this is the basic concept of replication when you do sharding. So I want to talk about how to actually set up sharding in MongoDB. Um, in MongoDB, when you utilize sharding, you have to set up three things, charge, configuration server, and query router. So first of all, charge is a MongoDB instance that holds a subset of shared data. Basically, it's a different uh, location that can store data. So something like this, there's a shard here, shard here, and each shard will contain uh, like a part of the data. So for example, if, the, if you have like big data and it should be separated into two and it should be stored in two different server, uh, it will be stored here and here like this. So this is basically different uh, physical location to store disk, basically different disk space to store your data. So each is one space to store data. So that's the shard. And second is configuration server. So configuration server will store metadata and configuration setting for full cluster of the shard. So basically it's here. So either simply store the information about how the chart is made. So I'll give you more information about this later. Basically, it's the configuration server, which uh, includes information about how uh, the uh, data should be stored or something, how the system is set up. And the query router is there. Query router is basically the regular MongoDB server. So, um, so far, when we use Robo3T, uh, we connected to the MongoDB server to send a query and to do operation, right? So that is actually query router. It's a regular MongoDB server, which is responsible for routing client request to the correct shard. So it's here. You can have uh, one or more router. Uh, in our example here in demo, I use only one router. So that's a MongoDB server. So we can start from a uh, configuration server. So let me show some demo here. So basically we have to set up three things. And the first thing I, I will start with is the configuration server. So in the configuration server, uh, we are going to uh, determine the setup of how the multiple shards should be 
uh, configured. Now, first of all, what you have to do is that you have to create a directory for a configuration server. So we can do it in a new terminal. So what I can do is this. So in my PC, so if you use Mac or Linux, you can use the uh, similar approach. I just uh, I don't know like uh, Linux comment. So I use the Windows as a demo here. So first of all, um, I need to make a configuration server directory. Uh, so currently I already made a data directory and here currently there is nothing. So I make configuration database uh, directory. So all the configuration information will be stored in this database system. So what this means is this. So uh, I want to show you this at the same time. So in our Robo 3T, so this is uh, when we connected to our uh, MongoDB server, when we tested our like, query and uh, inserting data earlier. And you remember that there was a configuration server which we didn't use. Basically this configuration server is where the configuration information is stored. So we just use the default setting, so we didn't touch it. But in this case, when we do sharding, we have to set up this. So I make separate uh, disk space to store configuration information. So I make a configuration DB. So here now, yeah, I made this a configuration DB. So basically in this disk space inside the data configuration DB, I uh, all the configuration information will be stored. And then second, once I prepare the uh, disk space for the configuration server, I will start the configuration server based on this command. So let me type this first and let me explain what it means. So first of all, I go to the where my MongoDB is stored. So this is uh, uh, the place where my MongoDB is stored, um, installed basically. And here I use this command. So mongod.exe and I use the option config server because uh, uh, MongoD is basically MongoD, Mongo database instance. So whenever I use mongod.exe, I will open new MongoDB instance. So by default, uh, by default, we have already one MongoDB instance running on our computer, which is this local DB. So when you install MongoDB in your PC or Mac, uh, there is one MongoDB instance which keeps running on your system, which is a local host with a port number 27017. So that's the default MongoDB server. And in addition to that, I'm gonna open another MongoDB instance uh, with the setting of a configuration server to set up the sharding uh, strategy, basically. So I, I mentioned that and I use this name replication set or this option replication set. And here I name, <clears throat> and I have to name what will be this uh, uh, MongoDB instance database. So, <clears throat> so I use configuration replication set and I use a DB pass option to specify where configuration database information should be stored. So which is the directory I just created earlier, configuration DB. And I have to specify the IP address of the server. So I'm going to use this local PC as a server. So I uh, specify local host and port number so here port number should be different from the instance which is already opened. So the default MongoDB server is opened on 27017. I use a different number 27019. So using this port number, my configuration server will be opened and I can communicate with the configuration server using this port number basically. So if everything is correct, I can enter. Then it will start, it will show a lot of different message and basically, uh, it says, if you look at this message, you don't need to look at everything, but uh, clearly it says, uh, yeah, everything is ready. But it says, can I use a non-local and something like that? Because 
I only set up configuration server. I didn't set up anything else. So it's currently working now. So I can keep it here. So I, I shouldn't close this. If I close this, then uh, my Mongo database configuration server instance will be closed. So I keep it here and I simply minimize it. Okay. So here are the options basically. To start the configuration server, you have to use this option. You have to use the replication set option and you have to type configuration replica set name, which is this. And DB pass, you have to specify where your configuration data will be stored. And you have to use a bind IP option, specify the server IP address, port option, specify the port number. So in the future, if you have a separate server for the configuration, you can type that server address here, server IP address. In this case, because it's demo, I'm simply using my local PC, local PC address, which is a local host. So if you have any question, please let me know. So this part is, oh, so yeah, so it's quite complex, right? So um, for the, so basically for the sharding, uh, only the conceptual part will be on the test, right? Like, uh, so something like this, right? Something like this. So some conceptual question will be there, uh, but I will not ask you to do this. This is uh, uh, too technical, uh, but I think uh, the reason I'm covering this here is because this is also an important concept and uh, some students actually want to know about this because, uh, uh, because the variation in our class is quite huge. So some students are more technical, uh, some students are less technical. Uh, but for those students who are more technical, I think that this information will be helpful, especially if they are interested in this kind of big data system and setting up the system. So I cover this and I show you demo here and all the um, code is here, so you can try it later. Uh, but uh, this part, the setup sharding, this technical part will not be on test. So don't worry about it, okay? Okay. So once you did this, basically the configuration server is started with port number 27019. Um, the next one is this. And now we have a configuration server started. And the next one is that we have to connect to this server and we have to set some setting. So how to do that? I have to open new terminal. So currently my configuration server is here. It is still running, so keep it this and open new terminal. So keep this, I minimize it. And in this new terminal, uh, what I wanna do is that I want to connect to the configuration server. So I go to where my MongoDB is stored. And I use mongo.exe to connect. And the configuration server IP address was a local host. And the port number was 27019. So I connect to my configuration server and then it show this message here. So it's con connected now, right? And then here I have to set up the initial setting of the configuration server. So I can use this command rs.initiate. And here you can type the setting. The setting is ID of the configuration server is basically what we named earlier, configuration repli replication set. And the configuration server is true because uh, we are using this not as a database server, we are using this as a configuration server. And the members here, here in the members, basically we are uh, stating how many configuration server will be used. In this case, we only use one. So uh, uh, ID, the first configuration server ID is one and the address is this. So we specify that information here. So if you, in the future, if you use more, like more than one configuration server, you can specify um, more this information here later. So close this and that's it. So it will be initiated. How do you check it? So here, if we say okay, and the value one, it's done correctly. If it's zero, it's not done correctly. So in this case, yeah, it's done correctly. So now if you want to check, then you can type rs.status. 
So you can check the status of your server. So there are a lot of information, but I skip this. If you want to more info, if you want to know how this works, you can uh, search the MongoDB document. Then there are more information, but I skip explaining all of this because there are a lot of information. So anyway, yeah. Then, uh, so after doing this, I initiated the server with this default setting. So configuration server setting is done. So next is sharding. So usually for sharding, you may utilize multiple different server, but because I'm testing on my laptop, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to make two uh, data space, two disk space, RS0 and RS1. And I'm going to use RS0 and RS1 as a, a different uh, chart, basically. So it's like a partitioning my computer into to the front space. So let me go to, let me open new terminal again. And let me type this first to make a two disk space. Okay, so now if I go to data folder, then there's a RS1 and RS0 like this. Okay, so that part is done. And the next part is this. So I start the chart, basically similar to what I did earlier. So I'm going to, again, use a MongoDB instance. So let me type this first and then let me explain. So again, I use a MongoDBXE, which is a MongoDB instance. So I'm going to open another MongoDB server and this one as a shared server. So shared server meaning that the data will be stored here and this part will be used as a sharding. And for the name of the application set, I name as a shared replication set. The name should be different from the configuration uh, server. So the database path is what we created earlier, C drive data RS0, the first disk space. And for the IP address, find the IP localhost because I'm testing on my PC. And the port number, I have to use a different port to communicate with this server. This time I use 27020. So if I type this, that's it. So this is another uh, chart server on uh, first disk space. So I minimize it, don't close it. And I open another command prompt. And this time I start the second shard on the second disk space. So in this, so again, I go to the, where my MongoDB is installed. And here, use the shard server option and replication set. And here the name should be the same because we want to put this, so because the meaning is this. So, so there are two shards, but I want to put them together. I want to combine them together as like a, uh, one system. So in the, there's a configuration server and the configuration server should decide where to uh, store data. So the collection can be stored here and here separately. So one collection can be divided into two and stored here and here. So I use the same name so that they are actually connected. So same name here and then for the DB pass, database pass, I use the second uh, disk space we created. And for the bind IP, localhost, and the port number 27021, the new port number. So in the future, uh, I put the localhost here, but if you have a multiple PC, and if you want to connect the digit to different PC, then you can put IP address of those PC, basically. So if I type this, yeah, it will be started, then my shared server is here. So let me minimize. Okay. So basically, those are the options here. So I just keep explaining this because I already explained. So if you have any question, yeah, let me know. And then what we have to do is this. We have to connect to one of these two shards and we have to combine them together and we have to initiate. So we made two server right earlier. So we made 
one shard server here with a 27020 with a disk space RS0. And we made another shard server with a port number 27021 and disk space we used the RS1. And because we want to combine these two, uh, we can connect to the first one. So you don't need to connect to both. So I'm running out of time a little bit. So let me go quickly. So let me open another MongoDB instance here. Let me do it a little bit quickly. Open. Oh, I see. Let me go here first. Mm -hmm. Like this. So I connect to the first shard server that I opened to 7002 uh, to 7020. Okay, so I'm connected there and I'm going to set, I'm going to use this setting to initialize it. So initiate with the option ID. So ID is basically what we type earlier, shard replication set. So those two shard servers has the same ID. And here in the members, because I made two shards, I list them here. So the first one was a localhost 2700 like this. And there is another server we opened. So you have to use a different ID here for each server. And host 27021, like this. Yeah, like this. So if we done, is it done? Let me see. Did I type everything correctly? So it looks like it's done. Um, let me check how it's that status. Okay, so it should be yeah, done correctly. Okay, so that's it. So basically now we connected. So by simply connecting to the first one, basically the first one becomes primary and second one will become like secondary to store additional information. So we combine these two together. So that's done. So shard to setup is done. So the last part is setting up the query router. So query router is basically the MongoDB server to determine where your request should be sent. So this part is quite simple. Uh, and because this is basically main MongoDB server, you will send your query to. So to do this, uh, let me, so in this one, so this one we already initiated, so I can yeah, close this here. And let me type this really quickly. So go to where my MongoDB is installed. And in this case, I use mongos.exe. So mongos is MongoDB server. It's not MongoDB instance, it's MongoDB server. It's actual server. So here, So here we use a config DB option to specify what is the configuration server. So we used this configuration server and the IP address of the configuration server was localhost with the port number to 7019. So we specify the, so in, so basically in the, in this MongoDB server, we specify what will be used as a configuration server. So we specify that. And then we specify the IP address of this MongoDB server with the new port number Two seven zero one eight in this case. So that's it. So basically, now what's happening is this. So I have a, a multiple here. So first of all, there's this configuration server with the port number two seven zero one nine, and there is a um, your shard server with two seven zero two one, and there's another shard server with two seven zero two zero. And lastly, I made this Mongo 
DB server with the port number 27018. So I have this four instance running on my PC. So basically what happened is that I have a Mongo DB server, which is a query router with a port number 27018, configuration server with a port number 27019, and it's using uh, this configuration database directory as a data storage. And I have two shards with a port number 27020 and 27021, each with a different data uh, storage like this. So these four are connected together now. And, and actually it's not connected yet, so they are running. And to connect these together, uh, basically now I have to access to the MongoDB server. So when I open MongoDB server, I connected it with the configuration server, but these shards are not added here yet. So I have to connect to here and I have to type this to set uh, finish the setup. So earlier there was a, yeah one command prompt. So I close this connection and here, I can connect to localhost 27018. And here I can add, so into this server, I can add chart. The first chart I will add is chart replication set, which was the name we gave earlier uh, with the localhost 27020. So we add it. Okay, so it's added. Okay is one. And I add another server, which is on port number 27021. So if I type this, it will also add it. So that's done. So now everything is connected together. The next thing is this. So to check whether it's working correctly and to enable sharding, we actually have to connect to the MongoDB server. So this is the main MongoDB server we are going to communicate. So uh, what we have to do is this. So we can now go to the Robo3T. And here, this is uh, our local database, but we can make another connection. So we can click this icon to create another connection. And here we can click this create to make new connection. Here we can type, uh, name is, uh, I say sharding test. Uh, and then address is localhost and the port number here is, here is 27018, which is uh, this MongoDB port number server, this one here. So click save and choose this and click connect. Then I connect it to charging test database, which has a configuration uh, database here. So what I'm going to do is that um, I'm going to test whether it works correctly. So I created a test DB database. So right click on the sharding test and click create database and I click create test DB database. So it's created here now. So currently there is no collection. And to enable uh, sharding, we have to enable sharding on the database. So I right click on the sharding test, click open share. And here I can type this comment sh.enable sharding and the database name, which is test db and close. And then if I click play icon, test db is not different. Oh, I think I have to do this in the, let me try, okay. Maybe here, so sh. Oh, I see. There was a typo. Okay. Yeah, I didn't put the double quote here. That's right. So if I type this, it works. Okay. So okay is one. So charting is enabled in on the this test database. And then uh, we can create some sample collection. So uh, there's these two files uploaded on the blackboard. So I, I just use one file to test it quickly. So I go here close this and open new share based on the test database and click open file and go to the desktop and I open this one JavaScript file and perform this to create CD collection. So CD collection is stored here. And what we need to do next is uh, uh, this. So Let's say that we have a CD collection and we want to share the data based on the state field because the CD collection has a multiple state. 
uh, and decode the information across the multiple state. So we want to do geo equation sharding, then you can use the state field. So before you shard, you have to make the index first. So to do it quickly, let me copy this and let me create an index based on the state. So open share here on the test DB and type this to line. So first is making an index based on the state. And second is to make sure that index is uh, using hashed uh, data type. So I skip the in explaining about hashed data type here, but uh, when you create a chart, they will use hashed data type basically. So yeah, everything is done correctly. Now, if I look at city, there's an index. If I open, it's indexed based on state. So you can confirm that. And then um, we can chart here now. So you can type this. Let me copy this and type here, basically using this uh, function, shard collection function, you can type sh.shard collection, test db.cd. So this uh, cd collection in test db database, you want to shard based on state field, which is a hash sheet. So if I perform this, yeah, okay is one. So the sharding is done. So in, the, in that case, uh, your state, uh, not state, the cd collection will be sharded based on your shard key, uh, state which you determined here. So remember that the MongoDB sharding is at the collection level. So for each collection you want to shard across uh, uh, different shards in your system, you have to do it uh, for each collection basically. So this is how you can check whether your sharding is done correctly. So, um, and there's like one more information. So because uh, our time is already over, so let me stop here. And for the like leftover, like a few parts, I yeah talk more about it in the next week.